Whether the team is performing clean or unsightly, we'll cover it all here on Washington Football Nightly. I, of course, am your host, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. Let's get to tonight's lead story. So here I am again. It's Thursday, and I'm still dressed in all black like the omen, which means we have a problem because after we get past Tuesday, I shouldn't be dressed in all black anymore. We're starting to turn the page. We're moving on. I should be donning the burgundy and gold once again or some form of team colors that gives us the hope that we can turn it around and get a win on Sunday. Yet we're still immersed in this cloud of darkness that seems to be hovering over us as if the ghost of Bruce Allen still exists here at Washington at Redskins Park and in the bowels of those walls inside that building. It's as if Vinny Serrato is still jaunting around and, 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 and haunting us. But we all know it's still Daniel Snyder and the stench of him owning his team that continues to haunt us as we try to move forward and turn his culture around and become a winner. What am I talking about anyway, right? So we knew that the benching of Dwayne Haskins would come with a lot of backlash. People were going to take shots and this was going to be a situation where, as Lewis Riddick put it, uh, he was made to fail in Washington and maybe he needs to go somewhere else where he can succeed. He was set up to fail, is what Lewis Riddick said. Remember, he said that when we put him in versus the Giants. So people are going to have their opinions and everybody's entitled to their opinions. None of that stuff really bothers me. What does bother me, however, is when we have self-inflicted issues. One of the things that Rivera was bought, brought here to do, and he's harped on since he got here, is he wanted to change the culture. That's what we all want as fans because we get tired of all the negative publicity and stories. And like I said, people are going to write what they want to write. People are going to do what they want to do. But it's the stuff that we can control that is frustrating, that we seem to be going around in circles with. And here we are again. Dwayne gets benched. And there are a number of different circumstances surrounding his benching. I thought Ron handled it very clumsily the other day when he stepped to the podium. I thought he said too much. I thought he did too much. I think all he needed to really say was, hey, I had one vision of how I thought things were going to go this year. They've went in a different direction. We don't feel like Dwayne is the guy that gives us the best chance to win with the division being what it is right now. We want to go in a different direction. And that's the end of that. He got a little chesty today, did Ron? All right, he got pissed. I told you he was irritated yesterday. He pretty much, he exploded on the, the media. And it, and it wasn't like, it wasn't TNT C4 explosion. It was like a firecracker. But it went off and they heard him loud and clear. And that was the end of that, essentially. So, so the Washington Post wrote a story uh, today that was released where apparently they've got a leak. And I thought we were done with leaks. I thought once Bruce left, he was the leak. And I thought we were done with leaks. I thought this was a different organization and that Ron was here and that the leaks would have been shored up by now. And we wouldn't have to keep sticking our fingers in dikes, in, in little holes to, to plug up the dike. And, and stop it from leaking all over the place. I thought we had, we'd cleaned up all of the leaks, gotten rid of the entire staff except for one or two guys, and it was a new day in Washington. Well, here we are. We benched Dwayne Haskins, and it seems, and I can't confirm nor deny this, all right, but it seems like somebody on the inside is flapping their gums, and this is so unnecessary. Look, this man is already down. You do not need to kick him. This has been the problem with this organization for far too long is that they don't know how to take the high road. Yeah, Dwayne may be doing some things that led to his own demise. And in that story, there's a leak reportedly from inside the building giving information that, hey, he hasn't been the first guy in the building, that Alex Smith was putting in more work than him, a guy that's a third string Star, uh, a third stringer at the time was getting to the building first, was putting in more film study, was doing all of the things that you think and like to expect from your starter. And Dwayne wasn't putting in the work in the film room. Dwayne wasn't putting in the work at practice and in the meetings. He wasn't doing the things that starters do in this league, going above and beyond the call of duty. You're not a regular player when you're the starting quarterback of an NFL 
NFL team. You have to take that initiative and go above and beyond. That was one of the knocks on Dwayne when he first got here is that he wasn't doing enough. I don't know if that's true or not. The fact that someone in the building reportedly is leaking this information, however, if it is true or isn't true, it doesn't matter. Why are you talking? Why is this a topic of discussion? Shut your mouth, okay? And now again, it's an anonymous source. This could be made up out of thin air, but I doubt it. Usually people don't write things. if they Now, I don't know if it's true. That's the thing we don't know, but somebody gave the Washington Post this information. And because of this information, you get a story in The Athletic. You get a story uh, for Washington, uh, NBC Washington Sports. You get uh, articles all over the place talking about Dwayne Haskins not putting in the work. And again, almost like you're defacing his character as a quarterback. Almost to, and we've seen this over the years, to elevate Ron's decision, make Ron look like the good guy and make Dwayne look like the bad guy. Why? We're all supposed to be on the same team. Even if he's not playing anymore, you don't need to do this to him. It's not necessary. He's not starting in the discussion. Let's move forward. You don't have to validate you benching him. And, I'm, and when I say you, I'm not talking about Ron like Ron did this. The fact that somebody in that building feels like they need to validate Ron's decision by leaking this to the media is dumb. We've been down this road before. I'm sick and tired of going down this road. We don't need this. We don't. We don't have to. You don't have to talk about Dwayne's lack of preparation. If that's true, it's a shame, but you just move forward. And, and, and if Kyle Allen plays well, it'll take care of itself. You don't need to bash Dwayne in the media about his lack of preparation. The play for, speaks for itself. He didn't play well enough. He didn't play well enough. Now, I think he should have been given more time. And maybe he would have ultimately gotten better. Maybe he would not have. But you don't have to do this either way. The play on the field spoke for itself. The film does not lie. Now, there were some things that I saw that I was nitpicking. And I, I chose not to bring them up. Because it didn't, to me, it didn't make sense to bring up. It was unnecessary. But there are little things, and I'll bring one of them up to you right now, and then we'll move on. I don't really want to harp on this any more than I've already done because it makes me furious, honestly, to be having this conversation with you because we're trying to change a culture. This is part of the old culture. This is the stuff that we've been doing for 20 years, infighting and back and forth and giving leaks to the media. This is stupid. But to speak to Dwayne's, and again, this is insignificant. This is why I didn't even bring this up with you guys. It was just something in my head. And I'm a stickler for little things. And so, when I, see, I watch a lot of football. Some of you don't watch any other games other than watch the football team games. And that's fine. I, you do what you want to do. I'm an NFL fan. I tell you that all the time. Uh, and I love NFL football. And I don't care who's playing. It be the two worst teams in football I'm going to watch. So, when I watch other games around the league, specifically other quarterbacks around the league, and I'll just throw out some random names. When I see Drew Brees, when I see Aaron Rodgers, when I see Patrick Mahomes, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Justin Herbert, you know, even recently. When I see any other NFL quarterback, it seems like, outside of Dwayne Haskins. And again, this is so insignificant. It's not, this is the reason I haven't brought, brought it up. It's just something that I saw and I stored it away in the memory bank. It's, it, I just took a mental note and I just kept it pushing. It, it irked me, but I never thought it was relevant. And it, it's still not relevant, but it, it kind of speaks to a broader picture maybe. And maybe this kind of all makes sense in, in, if you're connecting dots and drawing inferences. Anyhow, when I look at these other quarterbacks around the league, every starting quarterback for that matter, what's the first thing you see when they pan a shot to the sideline when they, when they come off the field? Whether it's a touchdown, whether it's an interception, whether it's a, a fumble or you just, you just failed on third, third down and had to come off the field and your team is punting. When they send that camera over to the sideline, when they shoot that pan shot of that quarterback, what is he doing? He's on that Microsurf, uh, Microsoft Surface tablet. And he's either sitting next to his quarterback's coach or he's sitting next to uh, one of the backup quarterbacks. And they're all on, t uh, on Microsoft Surface tablets looking at the photos, looking at the play trying to figure out what happened, why, what went wrong, or if you scored a touchdown, what went right, and how can we duplicate some of these things? What are they doing defensively? And so it, it doesn't matter. Touchdown, interception, failed on third down. 
They're looking at the tablet. They want more information. They, they want to know what's going on. And every time they show Dwayne on the sidelines, doesn't matter after a touchdown, after an interception, after a fumble, after a field third down, he's always next to the guy that has a Microsoft Surface tablet. He's never looking at one. And, and so Ken Zampezi is usually the guy. And I've even caught instances where it's Kyle Allen with a Microsoft Surface tablet. And he's looking at the photos. But it's never Dwayne. He's never looking at a tablet. I've never seen him with a blue tablet in his hand. Everyone else has one. He does it. He's looking off into the view. He's looking forward, you know, and, and someone's talking to him. It's Ken Zampezi's in his ear talking to him, or it's, or it's Kyle Allen in his ear, or it's Alex Smith walking over with his Washington shirt, and he's talking to him. And it seems like he's not paying attention. He seems like he's aloof. He's not even looking that person in their face or he's not even making eye contact with them or he's, it doesn't, he doesn't look interested. Like he's in his own head like, what do I need to do to be better? But it, it was just something that I, I nitpick on. Like, why don't you have a tablet? Are you too good for a tablet? Do you not want to see the pictures? Why are you looking off of someone else's tablet? Go get your own tablet. Why aren't you going through these, these photos with him as he's explaining things to you? Why aren't you looking at a tablet so you can go through it and see it too? Because the best quarterbacks in the league all are doing this. Every quarterback that I look at is looking through the Microsoft Surface tablet after they come off the field and you're just sitting there. Why? Now, again, it was something minor. Something that might not have anything to do with anything in the grand scheme of things. But it was something that always irked me. Why aren't you taking this extra time that you're getting on the sidelines to prepare yourself better to go back out on the field? That's always been something that's irked me with Dwayne. But again... The only reason we're talking about this is because he failed as a quarterback with this stretch. He may ultimately be successful somewhere else. His time in Washington as a starting quarterback is done. Okay, we've seen the last of Dwayne Haskins in a Washington football team uniform as a starting quarterback. I believe that firmly. After the last 48 hours and seeing the way things have transpired and the way this coaching staff has tried to distance themselves from Dwayne, he's done in Washington. OK, he's not coming back as the starting quarterback. And it wouldn't shock me if they tried to move him in the offseason. And, and that's probably the best option at this point. You're not going to get much for him. But I think that's best if everyone just parted ways and went their separate ways and moved on. But at the end of the day, when I look at this whole situation, I don't doubt that some of the things in that article that was written are true. I don't know if he's putting in the type of work that he should be. There are little things, I, again, I can't confirm nor deny that. I'm not going to j just feed into the narrative that, oh, Dwayne's lazy, he's not doing what he's supposed to do. But that was, a that was a knock on him when he first got here that he wasn't doing everything that he needed to do. I wouldn't be surprised if that's true. I just know I was irked by the fact that he never, ever looks at the Microsurf Microsoft Surface tablet on the sidelines when every other quarterback in the league, and even the, the guy that's your backup seems to be more engaged in looking at the tablet and more interested in what's going on on the field than you seem to be. That, that used to piss me off. But the only reason we're even having this conversation is because he didn't play well. Had he been playing well and had he been still the starter and we're 2-2 two and two or 3-1 and one right now, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And that's why I didn't bring it up because I didn't think it was something that needed to be brought up. But that's always something that has irked me. I can't speak for anybody else. That's just one of my pet peeves. But I digress. It's an it's a ugly situation. And, you know, everybody's going to have a take. I don't care. I really don't care. I'm just upset that we're doing this again. If you're changing the culture, leaks can't happen. Simple as that. Ron didn't want to talk about it at the, the podium after practice. You're damn right he didn't want to talk about it because you effed up. You can't have leaks. You're not supposed to. And I don't know if he had anything to do with it or if someone went rogue and did it themselves, it doesn't matter how it happened. It happened similar to COVID-19. This was my point to people that was like, hey, you know, you don't know how Cam Newton got it. I don't give a shit how he got it. He got COVID-19. There are over, and I said this on my podcast, over 1,800 NFL players in the league. Only nine or 10 guys have contracted COVID-19 since the league season started. Obviously, the other 17 and 150 plus guys figured out how not to get COVID. So you're obviously doing something reckless or somebody you came in contact that you shouldn't have 
has done something reckless. Either way, you put yourself at risk. Same thing with these damn leaks. I don't give a shit how it got out. This is, you're in charge of this. Someone leaked information. You need to put a stop to this. This is one of the problems we've had in Washington is that people have leaky mouths and shit gets out. You want to change the culture? First thing you need to do, stop the goddamn leaks. Let's get to in other news. So I'm going to talk about Ron Rivera and his presser because like I said, he was pissy today. Somebody took a nice number one in his Cheerios this morning. He wasn't happy. We'll talk about that in a second. We'll talk about what Jack Del Rio had to say. And I love Jack because Jack gives you absolutely nothing. He gives you Jack squat at these pressers. And I love it. But before we do that, let's take a look at the injury report for the first time this week and uh, what both teams are up to in terms of guys potentially playing on Sunday or not. Yeah, we're actually going to talk about stuff on the field. Real football stuff. Hey, isn't that a concept? So we start with the Washington football team. And what they've got going on uh, from an injury standpoint. And as you can see on Wednesday, a lot of guys did not practice. I, even though that's the first day and that's one of the more important days because it's the install day. Wednesday is insignificant in terms of whether you're going to play or not if you don't practice. It's a big day for you to just understand what they're trying to do from a, a scheme standpoint. They're, imp they're implementing their game plan on Wednesday, that's the first time you're going to get it in your hands, see what's going on, and kind of start uh, conceptually being able to see what they want to try to achieve on Sunday. But in terms of practice, if you're going to give a guy a day off, it's going to be Wednesday. If a guy is going to be a little sore, it's going to be Wednesday that he sits out. Like I've always said, Thursday and Friday are the days where you really want to see guys go out and give you something uh, in terms of practice, even if it's on a limited basis on Thursday, at some point you need to see a guy on the field in order to feel comfortable putting them on the field on Sunday, unless it's a veteran and you already know what you're getting out of that guy. You know, there are plenty of players around the league don't practice, you know, two or three times a week and they play on Sunday. But that coach knows if I put this guy out there, I know what I'm getting. And he's played injured before and he's shown me the ability to not practice and get it done on Sunday. We had a young team. We don't have many players that can go the entire week or two out of three days not practicing and then show up on Sunday and get it done. So practice is important for us. So when you look at this list um, on Wednesday, Marcus Ball didn't practice. Dontrell Inman didn't practice. Terry McLaurin didn't practice. Wes Schweitzer didn't practice. Steven Sims didn't practice. Greg Stroman didn't practice. Chase Young didn't practice. That's a lot of guys not practicing. It's Wednesday. Don't overreact. Uh, Jonathan Allen, limited practice. Cole Holcomb, he's going to finally come back. And I think we need Cole Holcomb. I'd actually like to see him get some reps, serious reps, because even before he got injured, he wasn't getting a ton of reps in that Philadelphia game early on. I'd really like to see Cole Holcomb be worked into the mix because our linebackers have been okay, but not good enough to keep a guy like Cole Holcomb, who is a tremendous athlete on the bench. Maybe he's not picking up the defense as fast as you would like him to. But I can't see Cole Holcomb not being able to get on the field and contribute in some way, shape, or form. He's healthy. He's a full participant on Wednesday, a full participant again on Thursday. He's no longer on the injury report, just so you know. So Cole Holcomb, barring any setbacks, he's a full go for Sunday's game for the first time since week number one. So that's good news. But as you get to Thursday's uh, injury report for Washington, it says follows. Marcus Ball, still not practicing with a non-injury related situation. So um, it could be anything. He, he could have a, a flu. You know, he could have something going on that is not injury related. So um, he could have a family matter and not practice. You, you, you just don't know. Those people, guys that miss practice because of non-injury related issues, I usually think they're going to play when it comes to Sunday. So we'll see what happens with Marcus Buck. Uh, Wes Schweitzer starts to worry me though, because this is the second day in a row Wes Schweitzer has not practiced with an elbow, and I didn't even know he had anything wrong with him until yesterday when he didn't practice, and uh, he didn't practice again today. Now, he was out there, but he wasn't taking part in individual drills or anything like that, so I'm a little nervous because we can't ill afford um, any more injuries along the uh, uh, offensive line, especially in on the interior where we're a little thin because of the injury to Brandon Sheriff, so 
Uh, I'd like Wes Schweitzer to be okay. He's actually playing some quality ball. If you've watched the film, you know that. I've talked about that. I'd really like to see Wes Schweitzer be okay and ready to go on Sunday. Uh, another guy that did not practice is Steven Sims Jr. Um, he's going to be out again with that toe. I really don't think he should have played in week three. I think, he re I think he made his toe injury worse. He hasn't even been at practice since the week three injury. Uh, keep in mind, he wasn't at practice a single day last week. He hasn't been at practice, not even on the field with his teammates, in street clothes uh, with his teammates uh, this week at all, just like last week. They have, no one's seen Steven Sims outside of the people in that building. So you know, when you hear reporters get to practice and say, still don't see Steven Sims anywhere, uh, that's because that toe is a lot worse than they thought. And I don't think he should have played. And you could see him favoring that toe against Cleveland in week three. He should have never played. They, I don't know if they were comfortable enough with Isaiah Wright at that time and they wanted to see how he would do and they wanted Terry to, uh, or Steven to be up just in case he wasn't getting it. But they needed to go in a different direction. He shouldn't have played. I think he made his toe injury worse. And now um, I'm thinking that we might not see him until after the bye week. It could be that serious with him. I don't know why they didn't. Just like Cole Holcomb earlier, I don't think they're utilizing this IR thing really well because Cole Holcomb missed three weeks. He would have been eligible to come off the IR this week. He didn't play the last three weeks, so why didn't you just put him on IR? Same thing here with Steven Sims. He's not playing this week. I don't think he's playing next week. He, he might come back next week. Who am I to say? But right now, it doesn't seem realistic that he's going to be able to help us this week or next. Why not just put him on IR? You're holding up a roster spot for what? doesn't make any sense. Anyway, I digress. Greg Stroman, remember, he was supposed to be fielding punts for us in week four versus the Ravens. He fields the first punt of the game. And limps off the field. We never see him again. He's got a foot injury. He didn't practice. He's not playing this week. So you can already draw an inference there. Okay. Limited on Thursday. And this is some great news for us because I wasn't expecting this. You get a limited Dontrell Inman with a foot injury. Um, that's, that's a new injury for Inman. Remember, he was on the injury report because of his wrist last week. He got over that. Now we got a foot issue with Dontrell Inman. So that's a little a little scary because, again, we're very, very thin at wide receiver. Terry McLaurin is limited today with his thigh injury. And um, I think Terry's going to play similar to last week. You didn't practice uh, Wednesday. He was limited Thursday. And uh, he ended up playing on um, – he didn't practice, I think, on Wednesday or Thursday last week and then was limited on Friday. And he ultimately played. I think we're going to see similar uh, results from Terry with the thigh injury, uh, they're just going to take it slow with him, but he's going to play. He's one of those guys you trust that doesn't need a ton of practice to get out there and play. And then Chase Young with the groin was limited as well. That was a shock to me. I, I was expecting him to um, not practice at all this week again. You know, just, you know, take part in some individual drills and maybe that be, that would be the case at the end of the week, like Friday, um, which would give us a shred of hope. And then we will find out he's not playing again. And that may ultimately be the case. Limited today, limited tomorrow, and then doesn't play on Sunday. We've seen that happen before with Kendall Fuller and Thomas Davis Sr. So I'm not getting my hopes up. I don't think he's playing. I told you from the jump, I don't expect to see him until week six versus the Giants. I told you that when the injury first happened, I'm sticking to that. Anything that happens contrary to that, I'll be surprised. Pleasantly, that is. But um, I, I just don't think that that's going to happen with... Um, Chase Young, I don't see him playing in week number five, but we'll see. Uh, as far as um, uh, full participants, Jonathan Allen and Cole Holcomb, again, Cole Holcomb, for all intents and purposes, isn't on the injury report. He's definitely playing this week. And Jonathan Allen is another guy. He went full today. He's playing too. So I don't worry about those guys, but th that's a long list of players on the injury report for Washington as we get to the Rams and um, Aaron Don and so I don't have the Thursday results for practice for the Rams because um, they're out on the West Coast. And because they're out on the West Coast, uh, their stuff wasn't released at the time of uh, the recording of this show. So I only have Wednesday's information for the Rams. But as you can see, a lot of guys not practicing. But um, at the end of the day, I don't think this is going to be a real issue for them. Injuries like they could potentially be for us. As you look, Aaron Donald's on this list. It's a non-injury related situation, so he's going to play. Uh, their offensive lineman, Bobby Evans, uh, has a shoulder injury. That could become problematic for them. We'll see. 
Um, it seems like every week we go up against a team with issues on their offensive line, and we really haven't been able to take uh, advantage of them because of uh, the you know Chase Young uh, not being healthy situation. So really what we're looking to do is um, continue to uh, monitor that situation. Uh, Micah Kaiser has been outstanding for them at the linebacker position, and he's dealing with a groin, and uh, that could be big. Andrew Whitworth, another guy that is a massive part of their team and what they do, he's dealing with um, a non-injury related situation. So he's going to play on Sunday, essentially what that means. Um, Cam Akers has been out the last couple of weeks with his ribs. He may be able to go on Sunday. Uh, we'll see. Keep monitor monitoring that. Um, but he hasn't been a real factor in the run game to this point. But hey, look, if we could have one of their running backs be out, that would be great. Um, also, Safety Jordan Fuller went full today, so more likely than not, he's going to play. And linebacker Kenny Young, um, he has a knee injury. That's a guy to keep an eye on, potentially, uh, as someone who may not be able to go. So, uh, as we get back to, in other news, um, Jack Del Rio and Ron Rivera spoke at the podium. And I, I can really get rid of Jack quick. Jack had really not much to say. Uh, and, I, and this is a weekly occurrence. I remember last year I would come up here and I would talk about um, our old defensive coordinator, um, Greg Minuski, and how I said his pressers were just useless. Because there was no information. He'd talk about the same things over and over again. He'd talk about uh, need to have better communication and how they needed to, um, you know, they needed to tackle better. And oh, if they didn't have this play or that play, if you take one play out, uh, we actually had a pretty good game defensively. Well, you can't take that one play out, Greg. Uh, you did give up a 72-yard run, and we did give up 227 yards of rush offense. And, uh, yeah, that did happen. And, yeah, they had two big runs, but those count. So um, he was useless last year. Well, Jack Del Rio is useless in, in the good way, in, in terms of, hey, I'm not giving y'all anything. You know, you can ask me a ton of questions. Uh, it's your job to do so, but I'm not giving you anything. So um, he doesn't give you anything. You know, they ask him questions. You get generic, bland answers. I, I just love it. You know, Jack's not giving away anything. He's old school. So uh, you get to Ron, and the first question of the presser, and I think Ron was excited because he thought, oh, okay, cool. They're not asking me any, uh, any Dwayne questions. And they, they were softening him up, you know, fattening frogs for, for snakes, essentially as a wise man once told me, um, they came out with an A, so Chase Young practiced on a limited basis. What did, what did you see from him today? Oh, he looked good with his movement skills, did some good things. We'll see how he feels tomorrow. So Ron was upbeat. He was like, okay, yeah, this is good. Maybe they'll ask me some Rams questions. And then they went right to the goddamn Dwayne questions. So um, I know we talked about this yesterday, but and so Ron was like, here we go again. So, you know, Ron answered the first one. And then the next question was asked by Chris Russell, and he brought up that Washington Post article, and Ron was not happy, okay? He said, hey, um, you know, Washington Post had an article today. I don't know if you uh, had a chance to check it out or you know anything about it, but um, it had some stuff in there about Dwayne and him potentially not um, doing the things he needed to do uh, to, you know, be the starter in terms of his work ethic and, you know, you know when he got to the building and uh, st film study and things of that nature. Do you, you have anything to add or elaborate on that? And, and so he, then he just, he popped off at that point. Look, we talked about this yesterday, all right? I said everything I needed to say yesterday. I don't think we need to keep talking about that. It'd be nice if we could talk about the Rams game coming up on Sunday. And Chris Russell was like, okay, I thought I'd just ask. <laughs> hey, don't bitch up. Don't bitch up because Ron's got a, throwing a hissy fit. You did this. You had a leak in your building. That's your fault. That's on you. All right? Clean that shit up. You don't want them to ask about this? Don't allow leaks out of your building. Okay? So, I don't feel bad for Ron. Only thing I feel bad about is that he's dealing with cancer right now. And nobody wants to be dealing with cancer and being asked the same question 20 million times. And then you think you're done with that topic. And then you show up the next day and they're still asking you 20 million questions about it. Well, you know how you clean that up? Don't allow leaks coming out of your building. Simple as that. So... He, he, he was pissy. He was upset. He blew up at Chris Russell, and, and that was one of those pop, 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 pop shots fired to everybody, all of y'all. I don't want to talk about this shit no more, all right? So he let off about five rounds in the air, pop, 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 pop. And after that, all right, well, let's talk about the, uh, the Rams game, you know? 
Let's talk about this defense. So they, they, they switched the topic real quick after that. It, you know, if he were in New York or Chicago or Philadelphia, he would have got another one of those questions. They wouldn't have gave a shit about that. They would have came at him with another Dwayne question. But, you know, and that's why this media, it's not as tough as everybody tries to make it out to be. But I digress. So he was asked about the defense. And his thing was, hey, look, we got to be better on third downs. You know, Jack isn't happy with the third down defense. Then when Jack was asked about the third down defense, Jack was like, yeah, we're doing some good things. There's some things we need to clean up, which I love the we need to clean up line from Jack because we get that every week seven times in his pressers. Yeah, some things we need to clean up, but uh, we'll get better. Jack is not giving you anything. So if you want something, you got to go to Ron because Ron loose, his lips get a little loose sometimes. You know, Ron will tell you some stuff that he talked privately with Jack about. And Jack's like, yo, I would really appreciate it if you didn't talk to them about this conversation. Same thing with Scott. Scott's like, yeah, that's a conversation between me and Ron. I, I you know, I'm not, I'm not really going to elaborate on that. And Ron will tell you all you want to hear. So sometimes I'm like, hey, Ron. Be okay if you just kind of zipped it up a little bit. You can get a little wordy sometimes, a little loquacious. Um, yeah, you don't have to tell them everything. You can give them a little tidbit and, and move on. So um, he talked about third down defense. And he's right. He's right about the third down defense. I, I've talked about it, you know, and, and um, uh, there was a question thrown at him about how um, the defense, you know, in, in sh- sudden change of possession doesn't seem to, and this has one, been one of my biggest knocks. And I'm glad I'm not the only one that seems to realize this. You know, sudden change of possession, the defense seems to not be able to force, you know, a stop or a field goal attempt, but they rather just give up touchdowns. Like, that's, that's what you have to do after you give up, uh, you know, a sudden change of possession. After the offense turns it over, special teams turns it over, you got to give up a touchdown because you got to make it sting. They got to understand that they can't do it, so you got to make sure that that team gets a touchdown. And he was like, yeah, we got to be better in those situations. We can't just give up touchdowns there. They got, they got to get, be better on third downs. And so uh, one thing Jack was asked about was the cornerback rotation because really since Kendall Fuller's come back, have you seen Fab on the field? Because I haven't seen much of Fab. And I thought Fab was actually playing well. So um, he was like, look, man, you know, just, you know, who you're playing kind of dictates what you do, who you put on the field. And granted, we haven't played teams that are putting four and five receivers on the field. But at the same time, I'm like, I would like to see some Fab. But – it, Darby's not playing terrible, and F- Fuller's our best corner, and he's shown it already. So I, I, I guess I get it, you know, but that, that was a question that was lobbed at Jack. But back to uh, Ron, uh, he pretty much was like, look, you know, he talked about Kyle uh, Allen, said, look, you know, Kyle, anytime you admit that a guy's a game manager, he said, yeah, Kyle's a, a game manager that can make some plays. Hmm. I, what I feel in my heart of hearts is that they want to get to Alex. Like he said in, in the biggest tidbit from Ron's presser was that, hey, this Kyle Allen thing, this is week to week. If Kyle stinks it up against the Rams, I'm going to Alex next week. He didn't say that, but he said that without saying it. Like in order for Kyle to remain the starter, for him to become entrenched as the starter, he's got to string together like three good weeks of, of really competent football. And we got to win two out of three of those games. And we got to feel like, yo, yo, Kyle's really killing it right now. We can't go away from him. If Kyle comes out and he has a modest game and we get blown out and, and, and there's some meat left on the bone, I think Ron right now is really wants to get to Alex. I think he really wants to see what Alex can do because he trusts the veteran. So... Alex wasn't getting any reps. They asked him, well, why not just go to Alex? If you really want somebody with experience, which is the reason you gave them, which is why I said you talk too damn much, you gave them too much, they're going to throw that shit back in your face, and they did. Hey, if it's about experience, which is what you told us yesterday, why not just go with Alex? He's got more experience than both of those guys combined. Well, Alex hasn't been getting any reps in practice. He was the third string. He wasn't getting any reps. So we want Alex to get reps. We got to rev him up. I think he wants to get to Alex. I think he's like, yo, Kyle, you got a short leash, my man, because I really didn't want to put your ass in the game. I really didn't. But I'm out of options because Alex isn't ready. He's like that 85 Toyota Corolla, and it's 21 degrees outside. You need to go outside and warm your damn car up. Don't just start that shit up and think you're going to drive off. You're going to be off on the road or side of the road somewhere. Let that shit warm up for about a good five to seven minutes, and then you get your ass in there and drive off. Alex needs some time to rev up the engine. He needs time to warm up. I think Ron really wants to go to Alex. 
if you're being if I'm being truthful with you. So we'll see what happens. Kyle Allen better play well on Sunday or else. It's essentially. And it's not or else Dwayne's going back in. It's or else you're going back to the bench as the number two. And Alex is going to be our number one moving forward. But he wants to get to Alex. This shit is real. I never thought Alex Smith would play again. This is amazing to me. It is amazing. It's crazy. I digress. Let's get to behind enemy lines. So this is our first look because we were supposed to do the first look yesterday. But, you know, the show had so much. Obviously, we had a lot going on yesterday. We never got to our first look at the Rams. But um, I'm going I'm to do our first look today and tomorrow. We'll, I'll have a whole set like I did last week of keys to the game and ultimately my score and more. So with this Rams football team, I watched them against the Giants last week. I was not impressed. And, I, you know, it didn't dawn on me that their 3-1 and one start really was aided by the fact that they've played our entire division until it was brought to my attention yesterday by one of the members of the media that said, hey, you, you, uh, you, you got to stop the, the Rams from sweeping your division. They're 3-0 and oh right now. You, you're, the, you're the last line of defense. Y'all got to do something about this or else they're going to sweep the whole division. And I was like, oh, shit, you're right. They have beaten everybody in the division. That's how they got the three wins. And the last one wasn't very impressive against the Giants. So I look at the Rams and I say, we got a shot in this game. Um, I'm not overly impressed with what they do. They, what they do is very simplistic. It's not a complex offense. We know where Jared Goff is going to be if we can put pressure on him. We know what they want to do. We know they want to run the football. We know they want to run zone, run blocking stuff. All right. You know they want to run the stretch. You know they want to go bootleg off of it. You know they want everything to look the same. It's going to take discipline on the part of our defense. First of all, we got to stop the run. If they're able to have success, which the Giants shut their run game down, and that's what really stagnated their offense. If you're going to have success against the Rams, you got to limit their run. And then off of that, you got to be able to stay at home, keep contained on the outside because golf wants to fake and then turn his back to the defense and then get outside the pocket. And if you don't stay at home, he'll get outside the pocket and then he'll find somebody and there'll be a gain of 15. And Sean's not looking for the 55-yard home run ball. If it comes, he'll take it, obviously. But they're looking for chunk plays. 15, 17, 22, 25, 19, 16. That's what Sean is looking to do. Chunk plays to the tight end, to the receivers, over the middle of the football field. So you've got to be disciplined if you're at the linebacker position. You can't, you can't suck up and react to run every time and allow the middle of the football field because that's where they do the most of their damage is in the middle of the football field on those deep dig routes and over routes. You come up as a defense at the linebacker position and they're going right over top of you, right behind you, and they're hitting you for chunk plays, whether it's the tight end or one of their receivers. And so they do a really good job of, of you know, window dressing. You know, they're one of the league leaders in pre-snap shifts and motions, jet sweep motion, ghosts, all of that stuff. So you can't allow the eye candy to take away from what you are responsible for on that snap. You know, don't overreact to certain things. They're going to hand off some of those jet sweeps. Unlike us, who sends a, a, a guy in, in, in ghost motion 80 times and we don't hand it off, seems like ever, maybe once or twice, they hand it off. You know, their, their receivers get carries. So... There's a lot of nuance to their offense, but it's really simple at the end of the day. They just out-execute you. The Giants were right there step for step. They just couldn't do anything on the offensive side of the football. We know about Aaron Donald. I'll talk about him more tomorrow. At the end of the day, this is a matchup that is definitely here for the taking, okay? I just want you to understand that. Will we take it is a totally different discussion for another day. As a matter of fact, that's a discussion for tomorrow but that's our first look at the Rams they're an intriguing team and look when they're hot they can score we've seen them put up points they put up 37 on Philly they put up 32 against the Bills who is a really good defense but when they're not hot they can be limited Dallas who can't stop anybody they only scored 20 points against the Cowboys all right the Giants who look they're much improved defensively but they're not an elite defensive juggernaut Okay, the week before they gave up 36 points to the 49ers with Nick Mullins at quarterback who couldn't bust a grape against the Eagles on Sunday. So the, the Giants defensively are not tremendous and they held this Rams team 
for three and a half quarters to 10 points before ultimately surrendering that last touchdown to put the game at eight and where it ultimately stayed at 17 to nine. We have a chance in this game, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. As we get out of here, I thank you guys for joining me on this show. Love to hear from you about the whole leaked stuff and uh, anything that you have to add to the conversation. Leave it down in the discussion uh, below in the comment section. Can't wait to read your comments. Um, I appreciate all of your support. And I also love the fact that a lot of you are, are starting to get wind of Patreon and becoming a patron and, and, and getting this film. It's important that you see what's going on. So you're in the know, you're in the loop. And so I appreciate that as well. But uh, some of you out there are still not uh, members of Patreon. What are you waiting on? Become a patron so you don't miss out on anything and you're informed. So when a decision is made, you're not in the dark. You're in the loop and you know exactly why that decision was made. But I'm your man, Louis T. This has been Washington Football Nightly. I'll see you guys next time. Have a good one. Here comes the diesel. Here comes the diesel. There's the snap, hand to Riggins, good hole, he's got the first down to the 40, he's gone, the 35, the 30, the 20, 